Revealed in upcoming episodes of this program are the contents of a recently unearthed repository classified by the secret government, the Phenomenon Archives. century, humanity has been pulled from the furnace of worldwide epidemics and saved from the clutches of military dictatorships by the men and women of science. Now that we've come to consider them almost venerable, what if we were to discover that the attitudes of these professionals have taken a turn toward the darker side? Are the people of science today serving an agenda of integrity or some vast corporate policy wherein the consumer is the unwitting guinea pig for the testing of profit-making pharmaceuticals. In December of 1912, Charles Dawson, a lawyer and amateur geologist, announces to the amazement of the world that he has uncovered in a gravel bed near Lewes, England, what appears to be the skull of an ancient human being. The world regales Dawson with the laurels of international celebrity, touting his discovery as the long sought after missing link, the evolutionary bridge between ape and man. The British Empire scientists who could not previously lay claim to a single major archaeological find are at last vindicated. The discovery of the Piltdown Man becomes the most prestigious archaeological find of its day. In 1953, Nearly 40 years after Dawson's dramatic breakthrough, chemical analysis of Piltdown Man's remains revealed that the very establishment which authenticated the find was duped in one of the greatest deceptions of all time, the Piltdown Man hoax. Ultimately, it is determined that the cranium belongs to a modern human being and the jawbone to an orangutan. Each is skillfully altered to appear prehistoric. The ensuing revision of history books and archaeological reference materials prove costly, but the cost and credibility to the scientific community is inestimable. There's corruption in any field. I mean, there are great people, and there are people that are somewhat corrupt in any field. Science is no different. Does fraud occasionally happen? Yes, it occasionally happens. Oh, God, I could spend an entire day telling you about the science and research fraud that my colleagues and I know about. The famous case of the Wright brothers, was it the New York Times said that they were committing a fraud the day before they actually flew their plane? Most of the disciplined rigors of science go on behind closed doors beyond the inquiring eyes of the public. Nevertheless, scientists in their often solitary quest for new knowledge enjoy an almost hallowed admiration. They are granted a virtual hands-off policy by our modern world to create, advance, and mold the future of civilization. 
I think that the society does have uh, the concept that scientists are purer than other people and they're omniscient uh, uh, and for that reason they, they can do no wrong. Given this revered social standing, the field of science is now more competitive than ever. There is enormous pressure on scientists to obtain grant funding. It is very demanding. The process is nerve-wracking for scientists. And in most universities now, you can't really do the research you want to do unless you have funding for it. And funding is more and more difficult to get. So at places like MIT, uh, you have to go where the money is, uh, even to publish. In the mainstream media of today, tales of science fraud abound. Some of the most classical cases that I can think of, uh, first uh, was a psychiatrist from Arcadia, California, who falsely claimed that a drug, THA, was a treatment for Alzheimer's, and subsequently that created a tremendous uh, uh, demand for this drug. Uh, but he was busted by one of my colleagues at the FDA who forced him to retract his results. Another case involves four pharmaceutical companies caught making payments to a top government researcher to secure his assistance in accessing confidential research he is conducting at the National Institutes of Health. And in a court of law, one group of industry-sponsored scientists stands behind their shameless, quote, conclusive research, unquote, that cigarette smoking is in no way harmful to human health. There was a junior researcher at the Harvard Medical School who published 18 major articles and 100 abstracts, most of which were completely bogus. He was flushed out by another colleague of mine uh, from the National Institutes of Health, Walter Stewart. Stewart was uh, also caught a professor at the University of California at San Diego who was writing papers at a rate of one every 10 days, and they were all based on complete fabrications. Uh, he was forced to withdraw and retract 15 of these papers. Unfortunately, the field of science is strewn with cases like this. There are more than one million practitioners of science in the United States alone. These men and women are, for the most part, actively engaged in the advancement of prosperity. Yet critics argue that science is too often done as fast practice. That these same scientists we have learned to depend on are guilty of cutting corners by rushing results in order to get their papers published, have their research ideas funded, and beat out their peers in an ongoing struggle for fame, glory, and financial reward. No, science is not a career for the faint of heart. Does it follow then that in a society where financial gain is considered the ultimate praise, the temptation to cheat has become too mighty? Has the reality of science fraud become so commonplace that fudging research is an accepted norm? An astronomer faking the discovery of an unknown star may set planetary science back years, as the Piltdown scam did to the field of archaeology. The ramifications of fudged research in other fields of science, however, foretell a much greater danger to our world and to individual human life. Well, the whole reason why agencies like the National Institutes of Health, the National Science Foundation and the Food and Drug Administration and many others have reviewers to scrutinize the work done by researchers is because of the extreme dangers to the public of faulty research. I'm aware of a number of faulty drug studies that uh, were contaminated and biased either deliberately or unintentionally, testing certain drugs on patients with a variety of ailments that ended up as articles in medical journals only to have been retracted later. Uh, if an innocent doctor had read any of these articles, they may well have prescribed that drug to a patient and ended up making things much worse. Good morning. Good morning, sir. Do you mind... Uh Showing your throat to these men. <laughs> Medical research and the development of new physical and drug therapies are specialty areas of scientific study. Because the potential financial gains to drug companies working in this arena are so vast, experts complain that the tendency toward conflict of interest is increased. Such has certainly been the case in the area of AIDS research. 
we have multiple interest, multi-billion dollar international companies coming into the field because they see the potential of offering the public all their drugs as the cure. Well, drugs have not been the cure. The drugs haven't been a cure for heart disease. Diet and lifestyle change has been. Drugs have not been the cure for cancer. Prevention has been the cure. I have just perfected a new remedy for locomotor ataxia. It's taken me years of research. You've been prescribing new medicines for me for a long time. I've paid you over $2,000. Mr. Spencer, I'd sooner cut off my right arm up to there than take another dollar from you if you've lost faith in my ability or my integrity. You don't make money when people become well. You make money when people stay sick. It's like the old analogy that Humpty Dumpty fell off a wall and all you needed was more horses, more soldiers. We had the same analogy with health care. All we need for health is more hospitals, more doctors, more diagnostic tests. I don't mind putting out the money if I, if I could only get better. But losing faith in me isn't going to make you feel any better, is it now? You don't have investigative reporters going in there to say, all right, before you offer the public anything and before you manipulate the media to act as your propagandist, let's put it to the test. No one's doing that because it's considered medicine is a sacred cow. Um, doctors are the high priests of this religion. And as a result, nobody challenges them. I'm sorry, doctor. I didn't mean to hurt your feelings. Now, what has happened is that the media is now running from company to company's press conferences, heralding the advent of some new miracle uh, breakthrough. Well, maybe since you put so much time on the new medicine, I ought to give it a fair trial. Instantaneous journalism, where they'll run out without any knowledge or background on a subject and trust the scientists or doctors for a company or a governmental agency to be the experts. I just follow the directions. Each bottle will last you three days, and all of your troubles will be over. Official science has never been good science. They've never won a major war. Not the war on cancer, not the war on AIDS, not the war on heart disease, not the war on arthritis. There's no cure for any of those. But it's like the official story. It's what serves the interests of those in power. As in the case of Viagra and FenFen, the relentless hunt for financial gain seems, once again, to be at the core of these problems. And the difficulty, I think, is that business people have very different motivations from scientists. And in the end, money makes the, the communication between the two very difficult. The business people are interested in, you know, the bottom line. How does the company, how can they make the company most profitable? Whereas the research scientists are interested in developing a neat technology, a new product. How can this technology help cure diseases and things? So there's a great barrier to having the two mesh. With media coverage growing more invasive, accessibility of information is adding to the public's awareness of science and how research is conducted. This new knowledge has made the public wary. Fear is replacing confidence, and instead of celebrating the merits of scientific advancement, there's a general reluctance to accept scientific results at face value. The scientific process has changed over the years. For scientists, professional advancement has always been tied to productivity. But these days, productivity is too often measured by the amount of money a scientist can gather for research. Scientists are thereby pressured on two fronts, from their employers who expect a continuing flow of grant money, and from grant-giving bodies who demand profitable results. Well, modern science is now being heavily funded by institutions, multinational corporations, and government agencies, and the competition and demand for funding is astonishing and just growing at an alarming rate. Uh, in this age of billion dollar atom smashers and multi-million dollar magnetic resonance imaging devices, the, the complexity and costs of research and maintaining the most up-to-date up technology are expanding at exponential rates. Uh, not at all like the old days of Charles Darwin or Isaac Newton. Uh, no money, no research, I'm afraid. Now, even the largest of institutional grants cannot satisfy the ever-expanding appetite for research dollars. 
Sometimes the money is set aside solely for universities, sometimes it's set aside solely for business, sometimes solely for government laboratories, sometimes anybody can go after it. And so we write proposals to government agencies. Um, we're usually in competition with all these other organizations. Uh, the win rate right now is somewhere between 5% and 8% of the proposals that are turned in actually get funded. wonder about whether or not they have to fly. Seasoned scientists find themselves going up against much younger, comparatively inexperienced challengers, each competing for finite funds in a glutted field. This competition for grants, status, and position makes the temptation to veer off the path difficult to resist. Uh, right now, uh, I'm looking for a job uh, just uh, because the, we are running out of the grant and chances of getting the grant is highly competitive. Many a livelihood is dependent upon the procurement of grant funding. Scientists fortunate enough to win this coveted cash find themselves hamstrung by the prerequisites of their patrons. Relationships develop which many consider unhealthy. Anytime a company like Pfizer funds a researcher, there is usually a contracting that goes on between the two as to where the restrictions are, what the specific outcomes are. Is there an expected outcome for the investment? Yes, there would be. But you're talking about hundreds and hundreds, thousands of people, hundreds of thousands of hours investment in bringing any single product to marketplace. With such extraordinary amounts of money at stake, grant recipients are subjected to such microscopic scrutiny by their benefactors that the possibility of failure can barely be entertained. Obviously, with the prospects of billions of dollars uh, of, of profit at stake with the, the development of, of a new drug or new technology, uh, grant recipients are subjected to massive scrutiny uh, by their patrons and supporters. Uh, I've always felt that this kind of relationship uh, between sponsor and researcher inevitably leads to uh, major conflicts of interest. Scientists, those honorable, distinguished people who diligently focus on solving the most complicated of problems, selflessly throwing themselves at the inequities of a savage world. Now we see that at least those in the private sector, those working for corporations, for instance, are subject to the same ethical dilemmas we are all forced to face. But how about those unimpeachable professors, the men and women covered by the security blanket of university life? How do they fare in all of this? The individual who is, be, who is able to attract grant funding, and particularly grant funding repetitively, uh, is, is viewed as being someone who is desirable to retain on one's faculty and certainly uh, to promote. Just one of the many examples I can think of is that of a researcher at the University of Paris who came up with absolutely outrageous claims of a, a homeopathic medicine that was discovered to be bogus by my colleague at the National Institutes of Health it was little surprised to find out that this researcher was funded by a homeopathic medicine manufacturing company. So university scientists are very independent and very rigorous in their approach to science and quite frankly are not as profit driven and therefore uh, basically will uh, analyze data in an appropriate manner and they will not be biased just because they have a uh, certain amount of grant support from a pharmaceutical firm. The f industry being involved in university research is a double-edged sword. There is the fear that there will be some uh, interjection of their uh, agenda into the research. Are they somewhat restricted in that they can't say they're going to do research on ABC and then decide to do research on XYZ without the involvement and the approval of the person funding it, sure, they shouldn't be allowed to do that. Given this environment, does the potential for objective scientific research really exist? What incentive is there for a scientist to research a lackluster group of findings if these will only result in his being passed over the next time deep-pocketed corporations come courting? It should come as no surprise then that many scientific researchers are becoming less concerned about whether data is contaminated, considering instead what can be done with contaminated data.
because if there's anywhere that science could be more corrupt, it would be in the, it, within the company itself, because there, those scientists are really profit motivated. Despite these consequences, the lure of short-term gain through fudged research is undeniable, and once indulged, becomes science fraud. Although incidents of science fraud have increased in recent years, this is not a new problem. Some of the biggest names in history have pulled off some of the biggest scams. It is widely known, for example, that Isaac Newton, father of modern physics, intentionally skewed data to make the work of a rival appear less important. Since his competitor's philosophy clashed with his own theory of universal gravitation, Newton improved some of his calculations on the velocity of sound and precision of the equinoxes to overshadow and malign the work of his challenger. The 19th century monk Abbey Gregor Mendel founded modern gene theory through the breeding and crossbreeding of pea plants. His results were so suspiciously perfect, however, that they prompted a later investigation which revealed that Mendel had tailored his data to help justify his theories. In a modern day example of scientific discovery gone wrong, the results of the cold fusion experiments of Stanley Pons and Martin Fleischmann were rushed into the public arena. Fusion reactions occur when two hydrogen atoms uh, become so hot that they fuse together, releasing a tremendous amount of energy. Because current technology demands that more energy has to be put into a reaction than comes out, uh, it hasn't been economically viable. Uh, however, Stanley Pons of the University of Utah and Martin Fleischmann of the University of Southampton claimed that they could create a fusion reaction at room temperature and make fusion energy a reality uh, with the potential of making uncounted billions of energy dollars. When a colleague working at a nearby university threatens to undermine Pons and Fleischmann's claim to their cold fusion discovery by going public with proprietary information, the two respected chemists are compelled by peers and legal advisors to bypass scientific convention and the accepted practices of the peer review system. There's a hypothesis, an idea. The idea is tested in, in the laboratory. Uh, it's written up in a journal. It undergoes peer review, which means people, experts in the field, look at that information. They test its validity. They ask questions about its validity. Then it's published in the journal. Then, of course, the scientific uh, community reads it. Then the scientific community tries to test, uh, can they repeat this experiment? And then, after that kind of scrutiny, it goes out uh, into the public domain. Others in the field are eager to reproduce the work of Pons and Fleischmann. The public benefits of such a discovery would be economically and environmentally revolutionary. Well, a cold fusion is a perfect example of how science works and judges its own kind. Numerous attempts to duplicate the uh, alleged results uh, by several independent laboratories uh, failed miserably. There weren't any marginal results that could even give hope to any cold fusion that worked uh, uh, the way that Pons and Fleischmann claimed. Uh, as a result, cold fusion was denounced. Uh, and all funding for cold fusion was cut off. In conclusion, we have no evidence in our laboratory with any of our samples for fusion. I'm very sorry that uh, uh, Professor Lewis has no information on the tritium levels. That is available and is available in the correction list to mm -hmm. the paper. We know the foreground, we don't know the background. I would like to the specifically... Background, I beg your pardon, the background is available in well, the corrections might, to the paper. That might be. I would like to specifically well, hear whether or not helium... Don't, don't, don't Could we go on, Could we go on to the questions, off. please? Certainly. This was the official story surrounding the cold fusion debacle. However, in subsequent years, independent scientists working to duplicate the work of Pons and Fleischmann were indeed able to produce similar results. But I do know that a great discovery has been made, and I do know that it's completely true, and I do know that nuclear reactions can take place in the cold. And I think that's one of the greater things to be discovered in this century. Once Pons and Fleischmann made the choice to take their claim public prior to publication in an accepted scientific journal, they were sitting ducks for the scientific establishment and the guardians of the peer review system. 
it was just a very unfortunate, apparently it was a very unfortunate time to make such an announcement uh, for various re political reasons really. The situation in the United States, the situation with regard to the program in hot fusion. That was against it, but uh, also of course was the fact that uh, we were not ready to make such an announcement. Journal publication is considered a necessary first step in establishing scientific merit and legitimacy. Data should be published in the most reputable of scientific journals. It should not be published first in the newspapers or other media. It should not be, quite frankly, disseminated through the popular media until, in fact, the information can be replicated. Science moves forward by having people uh, research certain claims on one side or the other, and that in fact they are able to resolve it by doing more experimentation or more tests so that they can figure out what is exactly uh, what it is that is actually going on. The cold fusion experiments of Pons and Fleischmann have been widely replicated over the past 10 years. It was absolutely clear in 1991 that there was a staggering excess heat source in water that would lead to ultimately technologies that would change the world forever. Today, we can no longer say that the evidence is overwhelmingly compelling. It is now 100% certain. The scientific establishment, in continuing to uphold the claim that the two respected chemists handed the world a gold brick, has now itself come under scrutiny, believed by many to be conspiring to suppress the confirmed results of the monumental breakthrough that is cold fusion. If this is so, then the scientific establishment is perpetrating a fraud of its own. But why? Why relegate a discovery that could result in pollution-free, unlimited energy to oblivion. The work of both Pons and Fleischmann were considered bogus, and thus no further funding, and their careers destroyed. Uh, they left their respective universities and shamed by the scientific community. With Pons and Fleischmann and cold fusion rubbed out, hot fusion or nuclear energy research could continue as the grant funding conduit of choice. With money as the primary motivating factor, it is clear that the knife of science fraud can and does cut both ways. The rigidity of the peer review, or as some would call it, the sneer review system, boldly dismissed the work of two highly respected and accomplished professionals, doing so despite mounting favorable data supporting their claims. When the Wright brothers first flew in 1903, no papers covered it at all because everybody was convinced, certainly the American press, that heavier than air flight was totally impossible. All the top scientists said this is nonsense. And it wasn't for about five years that eventually they realized, my goodness, this is real. Heavier than air flight is possible. And I think a similar thing is going to happen with so-called cold fusion, although it's seldom cold and often isn't fusion at all. The rush to announce results, to publish work, and establish ownership comes as a result of massive competition. In the case of cold fusion, the fraud perpetrated against Pons and Fleischmann by the scientific community has cost the people of the world 15 years in the development of a technology that would mean a virtually unlimited source of clean, free energy. Without grants, scientists can't research. Without research, scientists can't publish papers. And without papers, they can't achieve recognition, bring future dollars to their institutions, or secure their position on the faculty. In our research, we met with some of the most important representatives from each of several scientific fields. Fearing professional reprisal, they refused to appear on camera. However, each scientist made the same troubling allegation. The rush to publish legitimately or otherwise, comes as a direct result of grant competition. It's commonly accepted that the more you publish, the greater your chances of success in the grant contest. The bottom line, publish or perish. Well, pretty soon we see the professor, and then the dough is in the oven. Sure, pretzel dough. 
The girls seem to learn quicker than the boys, but then the gals are always handy around the kitchen. Some are good and some are not. The modern science has unfortunately evolved into a huge feedback loop. Uh, without grants, scientists can't conduct research. Without research, scientists can't publish papers. Without published papers, science, scientists can't achieve recognition or uh, bring future dollars to secure uh, their future. So the cliché publisher parish has a great deal of meaning, both literally and figuratively. Accomplishment is generally evaluated on multiple levels. One is the, the number of publications, but more importantly than that, the quality of publications. A uh, publication is important for scientists uh, and researchers for a number of reasons. One is because it does get the claims before their own community. Um, it, it ensures review. Uh, it ensures that it has gone through some, some process within the community that uh, assesses the credibility of what is being said. Some of the government agencies, for example, uh, the National Institutes of Health, weigh their evaluation criteria very heavily on whether or not you've published and whether or not the journals that you've published in are peer-reviewed journals. One goes from assistant professorship to associate professorship, and depending the rate of that promotion is generally dependent on the person's rate of accomplishments. So the more you accomplish, the more grants you generate, the more articles you publish, the faster your rate of ascent. While almost every university administrator would say on camera that there is no publisher parish quota system and in effect to judge the status of a given professor, they would all be at a complete loss to give the name of any high-ranking professor who did not publish at least three or four papers a year. This apparent life or death need to publish is especially significant for university professors. On top of their constant struggle to procure grant money, publishing is requisite to their attaining that elusive pot of gold at the end of the rainbow, that ultimate ride on the university gravy train, the guarantee of lifetime employment known as tenure. The philosophical reason for tenure is that it gives people freedom of speech. So that you can say something that someone else doesn't like, a different, not personal, but a different theory, and you're, you're protected. And you need that in an academic environment, otherwise there's no, there's no controversy. If you're afraid to speak out because you're gonna be fired, uh, then people would not have the same freedom of thought. As it has evolved in uh, the latter part of the 20th century, it is a reward system for truly outstanding accomplishment in science and uh, depending on the university, also interwoven with accomplishments as a teacher and as a clinician. And it is, again, depending on the university, given to no more than 10% to 25% of individuals on a faculty. If scientists fail to maintain the highest levels of publishing, they risk both their funding and their status at the university. Loss of grant money directly threatens earnings, since more and more often professors receive the bulk of their salary from research grants. What most people don't understand is that only a very small fraction of the researchers and professors at a given research university are funded by the university directly. That's called hard money. Uh, in a vast majority of other cases, uh, the university would set the salary range but not pay the salary. Uh, the researcher would be responsible for getting a source like the National Science Foundation or the National Institutes of Health uh, or a company to pay the university that then pays the researcher. That is what's called soft money and in these situations, scientists must perform the unenviable dual role of marketer and researcher. Are reports of science fraud overstated? Are the men and women we depend on to provide the medical products for ourselves and our children operating solely out of greed? Or are these just the self-indulgent allegations of an overzealous media? It's kind of like your income tax. There's probably about 5% of people that are crooks that don't even file their income tax. And then there's the rest of us, 90% of people. We do a good job because we know you know, you do an honest job because you know that the possibility is that you could be audited. 
and that there are, people are watching that are watching you. People pick on that five percent because they like to make uh, they like to read about it. Who was the press going to write about? Him? Mr. Jones? Oh, we we interviewed Mr. Jones today, and his per he had a perfect tax report. How nice! Or the guy this guy had this bum hasn't filed in five years, and we have bad schools because he's not paying his taxes. I mean, it's the same thing, of course. Uh, I like bad news myself to read about it. Is this type of sensational reporting eroding public support? If so, how does the negative publicity and allegations of misconduct impact the practice of science? Uh, the example of discovering the problems that emerge with FenFen. <laughs> are typical of what happens once it, it goes into a broader population base. Public confidence is eroded by these odd cases. But on the other hand, what happens the next day when someone comes out with an antibody that attacks breast cancer? We do experiments, we think we understand what's going on, we publish it, we think we know one answer at least, and three years, four years down the road, the methods change, the technology has advanced, and the results, change. The results don't change, but how we interpret them may change as time progresses. So a product comes to the market, generally after being tested in anywhere from several thousand to perhaps 10,000 individuals. When the product comes on the market, be it FenFen or any other pharmaceutical, we then have a population base of 100,000 or 500,000 or millions of people. Then one begins to see side effects that one did not anticipate. Or the drug may even behave better than one anticipated. The Viagra, I think, would be a good example of where originally the project wasn't aimed at the, the treatment for erectile dysfunction. It was aimed at some other kind of a treatment, and as we went through the discovery and the development process, we discovered that that was not going to be an avenue that made sense. There might have been four or five applications considered, but in the end, the one that looked like the most viable from a scientific, probably from a financial side, from an acceptance by society, would have been to uh, aim the treatments toward erectile dysfunction. They're not safe and they can't be made safe. Use a rubber. Well, I think the American public is pretty intelligent. I think they recognize that uh, wide use of medications frequently is associated with uh, unexpected complications. I think that uh, consciously or subconsciously, when they hear about uh, drugs that, uh, develop, that cause certain side effects and certain medical problems, uh, they, they recognize that something unfortunate has occurred and they're, they're concerned about it, but at the same time, I think they recognize that the system is working for the betterment of themselves and that uh, the primary goal of our system is to do no harm. <laughs> With multi-billion dollar interests hanging in the balance, the rush to get profitable products to market is the single most motivating force on the corporate agenda. Even the smallest amount of data fudging or most insignificant leap of faith can lead tragically to consumer deaths. However, in our attempts to look deeper into the media hype surrounding science fraud, we've found few smoking guns. Unlike other aspects of our society, the scientific community has developed effective checks and balances that have helped preserve the integrity of the scientific method. Scientists concerned about fast-track practices foretell dangers wherein even the tiniest fudge can result in human tragedy. Spokesmen for the scientific establishment would uphold that safeguards are continually renewed through the effective checks and balances that make up the very conservative peer review system. The larger question may be, is the peer review system so overbearing that it is obstructing the very pathway to discovery? No one is doing, making that much of, a, of an advance. Uh, so the advances are small and they're not, uh, most of them are not terribly detrimental. They're helpful to society. Nobody is working on making Frankenstein. Or nobody is Dr. Frankenstein working on making a monster.
there are occasional bad apples, but virtually all the scientists are really trying their best, are honest, and are pursuing what they believe are exciting venues of research. There's pressure on them, but I think that most of them realize that fudging data is not the way to do it. And even if they do it, those that do it, do it in such a small way uh, as to be insignificant for society in general. But there is that fear. In fact, it probably might even be even a little bit exaggerated, that fear. If you go and publish a paper and you do it for a company, in that paper it has to say that this research was funded uh, by, that, uh, uh, by that company. If you give a talk about something, you have to say that the, some of the facts that I'm going to present here were uh, part of a study that was uh, supported by X uh, company. So there is that, uh, that area of conflict of interest. The major interaction between the pharmaceutical industry and academia is through various clinical trials. That is where the pharmaceutical firms finally recognize whether they have a good product or not. They have enough preliminary data, but they need to have it corroborated in a clinical setting. And quite frankly, it's not biased. And drugs will either then drop out of the uh, clinical marketplace or if they're good drugs, their development will then go on to the FDA. But at every step of the way, uh, the product is evaluated. Actually, the commercial community is interested. They're not interested in having somebody be corrupt and, and ruin the name of their product because uh, they, did, they tried to please them and did something that was uh, out of the ordinary. So uh, this uh, science undergoes more scrutiny than anything else. There are all these steps that ensure that the products that come to market should be safe and helpful. And I think it's up to each scientist that they maintain integrity, that they do the best science they can, and that they present the results as what they actually are. And the FDA is uh, not known as being an easy uh, mark for the pharmaceutical industry. They want hard data, and they analyze that data with consultants, and they will not approve a product unless they are certain of its efficacy and of its safety. Science progresses with sound, reliable results, only to the degree that scientists are honest. The existing system of checks and balances works to protect us from the few who do decide to defy the system. But when a system becomes too rigid, money-motivated and political, there is another danger, that the truly important scientific work, like the work being done today in the area of cold fusion, either never gets recognized or is intentionally discarded by a system resistant to change. The peer-reviewed system in this country, both for the funding of grants and for the publication of manuscripts, is so rigorous and at, conducted at such a high level, meaning referees who review the articles, editorial review of the journals, these are people that are highly educated, highly intelligent, have a great spirit and love for life, for their own and for other people. And even though we are doing experimentation, there are uh, tremendous safeguards built in, again, both internally and externally, to uh, obviate the chance of there being problems. <laughs> In a world where corruption, greed, and political maneuvering often win out over the virtues of the human spirit, it's comforting to find a pursuit which has constructed a way to keep its own house in order. While the history of science is littered with incidents of fraud and flagrant misrepresentation, we have found little to support a contemporary conspiratorial plot in the Phenomenon Archives, 
I'm Dean Stockwell for Phenomenon. Step right up. I got a pill. Makes your car run on water. Spray your grass. It'll stay green forever. There's a million ways to lose some pounds. And get rich quick schemes going around. Don't get the wool pulled over your eyes Even in science there's lies